Jim McLaren, welcome to the Top Gun Zoomcast. Uh, I appreciate you joining me today and look forward to talking to you about your illustrious career. Well, thanks, Steve. I'm glad you've invited me to do this, and I'm quite honored that I was asked. Um, you know, I, I did a mutual friend of ours interview, Carrie Mogerman. About I know Carrie years. well. And it was so interesting for me to gather all these insights, and I'm looking for um, unique perspectives, although a lot of us probably have some common ideas on how we should approach our cases. Everybody comes at it a little differently. Would you agree with that? I do. I do. You know, it's, um, I have a habit when I first meet with a client to try to harvest all the information that I can harvest. And a lot of lawyers think it's more of a time to answer questions for the client. And I, I, don't, I don't agree with that at all. Uh, that's the time to understand the client, get to know the client, find out about their case. And right from that very first hour or two, I visualize myself standing in the middle of the courtroom trying that person's case. And that's how I view it all the way through whether I'm preparing a trial outline or an examination list for direct or cross or writing a brief, I always have that perspective, standing in the middle of the courtroom and is it gonna sell, is it gonna work? Um, am I gonna be successful? Do you actually develop in a rudimentary way the theme of your case, the storyline of your case at the consult? Um, yes, yes. I, I think you have to do that very early. Um, you know, there's good guys and bad guys, and, you know, we represent both, good girls, bad girls, and um, you got to decide whether you're going to fight it or you're going to uh, do a, um, you know, mea culpa, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. Depends on what your facts are. And um, so I like to have a, a theme, a theme that, accentuates the good points of my client, what they've done. And, you know, kind of, oh, by the way, I, I was bad. I, um, I did this, that, and the other thing. But, you know, it's outweighed by the good things I did during this marriage. I'm reading a book on cross-examination by a former uh, public defender in federal court. His name is Terry McCarthy. And he describes the theme of the case simply as, your good facts and your bad facts. I agree with that. There's I a think lot to be said about that. Outlines, you know, and um, you and I have taught at the ABA NIDA Institute for a lot of years. And they taught us the importance, and we taught our students the importance of developing a theory and then uh, filling in around it with the good facts and bad facts and how you're going to play that out, um, which is fundamental. Um, one of my one of my first law partners, he had practiced law in Chicago. His name was Frank Drain, and he practiced with um, Kirkland Ellis in Chicago and was second chair to Phil Corboy. I think the law school there in Chicago was named after Corboy. It is. And Frank had the best trial skills I have ever seen, um, and he would always develop an incisive theory. And he could take anybody, any place, in any courtroom, he could take them on. And we did a lot of trials in federal court early in my career, and they were uh, medical malpractice cases, product liability, all plaintiff sides of cases. I did a number of civil wiretap cases in federal court. I probably have tried first chair 50 cases in federal court, and second chair probably another 50. And I learned immensely from Frank, his skills. And I watched him one day, and I'll, uh, things you remember about people and what they taught you. And they got a witness that we really didn't expect and had no idea what he was going to say. And this was, you know, this is in the 1970s, so uh, discovery was a little different then than it is now. And uh, he got up, and the witness just killed us, at least I thought. Frank got up very smooth, very prepared. Um, and I, I learned a couple of things, and that is if you take a spear in the chest, 
you never show it. You never show it. And he got up and tore that witness apart from the seat of his pants. And he did a, did a great job. It's, it's kind of like the Godfather movie. When the Godfather says to his brother, never tell him what you're thinking. And you should never show emotion, uh, at least hurt emotion, emotion in a, in a trial. You have to be able to try the case. You're going you're gonna to take some hits. And you got to take them in stride. And you can't ever acknowledge that you took the spear in the chest. you got to take it and move on. Yeah, I, I've often felt that our greatest skill is self-regulation, self-control. Because you take some shots sometimes, and not to react to it is, is sort of hard. It is. And it's, um, I, I believe in that greatly. Um, um, take your theory. And I usually tell people, clients say, they, they like to talk a lot, well, my husband or my wife is going to say this or going to say that. And I, I have a stock answer for that. I really don't care what your spouse is going to say. I care about what you're going to say and our theory of the case and what we want to put up. That's most important. And we always keep our eye on that ball. And I'm not going to be distracted by what they say. I want to know what they're going to say and be prepared for it, but that's down in the pecking order as far as I'm concerned. Let me ask you a question about cross-examination, because I wrestle with this myself. When you do a cross, do you cross off of the direct, or do you cross based upon whatever story you're trying to tell based on your theme and your theory? Well, I, I believe in controlling the witness on cross. So I, I, in all ways, I want to control the witness. And usually if it's a principal witness, I have their deposition. And we always do a summary of that, that witness's deposition, <clears throat> meaning that me or my staff member, and I, I really prefer to do it myself, goes through and highlights the important parts of a witness's deposition. And then we separated into subject matters. For instance, marital fault or uh, contributions or the business, or whatever it may be. And we do it by subject matter. And then the, the depositions are electronic. So we resort it based upon subject matter. And then we resort it again on relative importance. So that's, that's really where I go to build my cross-examination. I would never start an examination by addressing or attacking the main uh, topic that the witness is up there on in terms of what their position is. That comes later. And it, I try to do that when I've scored some, after I've scored some points, where I've started to knock down the credibility of the witness or at least create some doubt and then go to their position and try to pull it apart if I can. But it's, again, it's my theory, not what they said on direct necessarily. So you raise a good point, primacy. Get the good stuff out first, the stuff you want the judge to hear, and then go from there. Yes, yeah. That recency and primacy is, is very important. And um, forget what you call it, where you say it three times. I, I like the three times thing. Judges always tell me, if I've been repetitive, and usually I'm, I try not to be repetitive, but sometimes I'm repetitive on purpose. Um, Mr. McLaren, you've asked that question three times. Well, I'm never off put by a judge saying that. And many times they'll say, Judge, I felt it was important. I wanted to make sure you heard it. And, um, you know, when a judge is listening, only listening, they only have about a 10, 15, 20% retention rate. So when you're doing an examination, the judge has an 80% chance of not remembering what the heck you asked and the answer. If you're good or lucky and you have the spoken word and you have an exhibit and you always should have the exhibit that's going to be marked, an exhibit for the witness, an exhibit for me, and an extra scribble exhibit for the judge, when you got that piece of paper in front of the judge, the retention rate goes way up. And then if you add to it some big exhibit and that sort of thing, um, it even drives it higher. So your goal is 
um, to re be repetitive but not be obvious about it. You are a um, advocate of the use of demonstrative exhibits, demonstrative aids at trial, correct? Yes, yeah. And, and what are the sorts, what are some examples of demonstrative aids that you might use? You use a computer in the courtroom to show yes. exhibits? I, um, I, I always take somebody with me to run the computer. One, because I'm not good at it. And two, um, I want my presentation to be smooth. And I want the person running the computer, they, have, they know my outline. They know pretty much where I'm going. And they have the exhibits typically in the order in which I'm going to address them. And for instance, if you have a tax return, you don't want a 50 page tax return stuffed in front of the judge without highlighting what's important. Um, and that's, that can be difficult to do. Um, some judges are not good with that sort of thing. They're not good with numbers or better with kid stuff. So the tax returns, you know, you need to highlight them, you need to be prepared to do call outs um, so that when you put a tax, like the first page of the tax return up to get the, uh, the big income numbers, you want to highlight that, do the call out or it blows it up, judge sees it. Um, some of that's kind of tricky because um, you, know, you can kind of fumble in the courtroom. So we practice ahead of time to make sure we have that right, but something. You know, something always goes wrong. Um, I had a witness on the stand, my own, my own client on the stand, and he was so vain, he did not wear his glasses. And I didn't notice it. So he's up there, and I've got this big screen, and he's squinting like a squirrel. And I realized he can't see the screen. And I said, put on your glasses. He said, they're in the car. I said, you know, he can't go to his car. So I said, come on down here. And I had him stand next to me. So he's like right in front of the screen. Um, but things like that happen. So I always say to my witnesses before I put them up there, you learn something every day by uh, getting burned one way or another. Make sure you bring your glasses. Make sure you have them. We don't want to stumble with that. But I, I like demonstrative evidence. Um, I remember a case. I got a call on a Saturday night from a fellow who was in the jungle in Africa. And he worked for a big company, I think it was Bechtel. And his job was to build a desalination plant in the jungle next to a big river. And so they take these big giant helicopters and bring in these living pods that they live in and they live there and they do the work. And he said, Mr. McLaren, a lawyer gave me your name. I'm sorry to call you on Saturday night, but I just saw my wife take move $800,000 out of my bank account. He was monitoring on a satellite phone his bank account. And um, so we ran that down and we got the U.S. Reserve to re reverse stop the transaction over the weekend, which was a miracle. I'm not quite sure how we did it. Uh, but we were in court, I think it was like by Tuesday. And we had done some research on the wife. And South Carolina, where I practice, is a false state. And adultery bars all claims to alimony. And it also plays into everything else, including equitable division and attorney fees. So we had gotten off of social media that we had researched uh, a picture of this lady in a sex act with her boyfriend. So she's on the witness stand, and I had the eight by 10 blow ups of these things from social media, and they were nasty. I mean, they were, they were nasty. But they were demonstrative, and they were irrefutable. And our judge was a female judge um, who was more like a man. She had a kind of a, she would curse once in a while, and she was just more like a guy than a lady. And so, I handed the photograph to the witness and I said, can you identify this? She says, yes. And I said, is that you? She said, yes. And I said, is that your living room? Yes. And that's a, what, a green couch there? Yes, and that's what you have in your living room? Yes. And, um, 
And I said, what is it that's in your mouth? And she had to answer, and I don't need to give you the details on what it was. Yeah. And I said, that, that doesn't belong to your husband, does it? No, that's so-and-so, such-and-such. She said, yes. And I go to move it into evidence. And the judge, um, Vicki Snellgrove was her name, she like looked away, marked it, and um, this lady had to give back all the money, pay a lot of fees and all that sort of thing on that one photograph. And then we also had blow ups of the transfers of the $800,000 um, and she just got whacked in court, but it was only maybe three or four exhibits that were so important. And that story could have been told with words, but the demonstrative evidence was much more powerful. Um, when you deal with, for instance, experts like CPAs and financial experts, their testimony is usually very dry. And you, you know, some you can almost go to sleep listening to it. And I I I believe in letting those guys or ladies um, loose. So I'll ask them a question that lets them really answer it and expound on the detail. Um, but you got to have exhibits, and it's just got to be a page or two. Um, and again, one goes into evidence, one goes up to the judge as a scribble copy, and judges really appreciate that. Not all lawyers do that. Uh, copy for the witness, copy from me. So we have a rule that anytime we go to court, we have exhibits, we have an original and five copies that we take with us. And that leaves one extra copy, which I call the control copy. And that's a clean copy of whatever the exhibit was. So we have one that's not been marked up. It's preserved. So if there's an appeal, we've always got a good, clean copy of what the exhibit was. So an original plus five is a rule. My staff, well, my staff understands it, but clients say, why do you, what, well, you're costing me all this money to make these copies. I say, that's the cheapest thing in your case. It's, I wouldn't worry about the copy cost. Good investment. Uh, yeah. So you've tried jury cases and bench trials. I used to try jury trials. Um, I don't anymore. We're all, our, we, our family court is bench trials decided by a judge. Um, you know, I, I call us, the way we find ourselves through our careers, we are accidental tourists. And let me tell you what I mean by that. Things just happen put you in a circumstance and it, what happens is determined by what you do and whether you choose to avail yourself of that incident. When I was um, in law school, um, it was, um, I clerked for a lawyer, his name was Henry Kirkland. He was a great lawyer, great mentor. He was a plaintiff's lawyer. He grew up in what we call the mill village, where a lot of people who worked in the textile mills lived. Using his words, not my words, he would call all the people he grew up with in Olympia, South Carolina, lintheads. And if he got a linhead on the jury, the other side had no, no way of winning. And Mr. Kirkland was loyal to these people. I mean, he. He loved his clients and they loved him. And every Friday they'd line up in the middle hallway in the law firm to bring him vegetables and to pay him. And they'd bring $10, $20, $50, six tomatoes. And they always shook Mr. Kirkland's hand and thanked him and he, you know, and he thanked them. So he, had, Henry, I always called him Mr. Kirkland. Mr. Kirkland asked me to research an issue that he had to argue that afternoon. And it was some kind of personal injury case, and I forget what the issue was, but he was dead wrong. I mean, there was no law to support what he said. And he called me Mac, and I brought my memo to him, and he read it in short, and gave all the authorities, and had copies of them. And he said, Mac, did I ask you to research this for the other side? <laughs> I said, no, sir. 
And I said, that's, that's what I, what I found. That, that appears to be the law. And there is not a minority opinion. This is the opinion. He goes, well, at three o'clock this afternoon, I have to argue this issue. This is the only position I have. I have no other position. So I need you to find me a footnote, a sentence, sentence fragment, anything. Just find me something so I can stand up and argue. Well, I went back to it and I found some footnote that halfway supported what he said. Not even halfway, it was, a, it was remote. And I brought it to him and he looked at me and he said, perfect, I knew you could do it. And so he went out the door, went and argued it, won it, and he came back and said, Mac, you did a great job. You did a great job. And I, I learned from that. I, you know, I had the same law partner for about 35 years. He did all our research and appellate work. His name was Dixon Lee. He retired last year. And everything he saw, he saw as black and white. Henry Kirkland saw everything as gray. There's no black or white. There's always a way, go find it, think about it, ride it, and you can do it. You can win cases that other people can't win. And that, that was a very valuable lesson for me that I, I've never forgotten. Um, he was a great mentor, great guy, great trial lawyer. I mean, he, was, he tried all kinds of cases, um, uh, everything from criminal defense to plaintiff's work, to commercial cases. People hired him to do everything. He was a, a consummate trial lawyer and a good person who cared about his clients, and they loved him. And they loved him. That breed is not around anymore. The general, practi the general practitioner is not, not around that much anymore. No, it's not. And I, I said before that we much of what we do is as accidental tourists. And I had a couple of offers to go with law firms when I started out. And um, we had a, I was a private investigator also while I was in law school. So that's where I learned how to, all about domestic surveillance and following errant spouses around, that sort of thing. And uh, approaching witnesses and getting reluctant people to tell you the story. and write it down and have them sign it, that sort of thing, photographs and whatnot. So I had this little office, and the day I got sworn in as a lawyer, I went there and I was just sitting in my chair reflecting, and two people came to my office. One was a named, guy named Dewey Campbell, and the other guy, I don't remember his real name, but he went by Nasty. Nasty was... Um, country guy from Bamberg, South Carolina. And Bamberg is a very rural area that used to be kind of a political control place in, in South Carolina. And he came to Columbia to do a pig picking. He was cooking the pig, a whole pig and one of the big cookers. And um, he got arrested for like DUI, driving under the influence five, he had an alcohol problem. And he blew 28 on a breathalyzer. And that's like probably a tenth of a percent from being dead. And he was found sitting in his car, running uh, in drive, with his foot on a brake, and a, a, a half-gallon jug of bourbon in his right hand, almost empty. And so um, I tried that case. He was my, one of my, he was, the, one of my, he was my first client. And I said, how did you come here? And he goes, you know, I, people told me. I'd been a lawyer for like three hours. <laughs> and I don't know how we got there. And I, I said, you know, there are a lot more experienced lawyers in this town that can probably help you. You have a very hard case. And he says, I want you to represent me. And I brought $5,000 with me to retain you. Now, $5,000 in 1976 was a lot of money. That was client one on that afternoon. Client two was uh, Dewey Campbell. Dewey had li lived in Greenwood, South Carolina, and he had a bad experience with a physician, sued him in a malpractice case, and the jury came back with a defense verdict. 
So he comes in and I said, why me? Why, why, how, how did you get? He said, well, I just, you know, I think you're the guy. And I said, I've never handled an appeal from start to finish. And I know nothing about, you know, overturning a jury verdict. And that's very hard. He goes, well, I brought $5,000 with me and I think you can do it. And so he paid me 5000 so on that day in November of 1976, I earned $10,000 in about two and a half hours. I didn't earn it, I got paid it. And um, I decided at that moment, I did not want to share it. And therefore I did not want to go to work at a big law firm. I wanted to be Jim McLaren lawyer. So I put out my shingle. Um, I tried um, Nasty's case and got him acquitted which is a story in and of itself. And I took up um, Dewey Campbell's case to the um, Supreme Court at that time and got it reversed. And I developed a theory at that time I've never forgotten. And that is, there may be a lot of things that were done wrong in the trial, but you gotta pick the best one. Pick the best one, ride that horse. Don't say three things are wrong, 10 things are wrong, one thing. And so I got it reversed on an evidentiary ruling where the judge had let an expert testify based upon the opinion of another expert, which at that time was not permissible. It is now, but it wasn't then. And I went back and got a jury verdict for him. So those were my first two clients. And I call that being the accidental tourist. I couldn't tell you how that happened. It just happened and they were my first two clients. Um, and so how did your tourism end up in family court? How did you end up becoming a family court specialist? Um, well, part of it came from doing the private investigation work because I got to meet all the divorce lawyers. So I had a relationship with all the good divorce lawyers around the state, statewide, um, before I finished law school, before I became a lawyer. And, um, when I got admitted, they all felt the need to help me. So they would send me cases. And um, you know, they, they weren't great cases. They weren't terrible cases. They were things they didn't want to do or they had a conflict. And so pretty soon I had a lot of divorce cases. And um, again, this is another point of being an accidental tourist. While I was in Mr. Kirkland's office clerking, I worked on a divorce lawyer's divorce case, and also did private investigation stuff on his cases. And we became good friends. And around 1980, he had a major heart attack. He had the largest divorce practice in South Carolina, which was centered in Sumter, South Carolina, one county over. And um, he was told that if he kept on practicing law, he would not survive. So he had to make the decision what he was going to do, practice and die or give up his practice and retire. And um, so he called me to his hospital bed and said, I'm going to retire. Here's why. And I want you to have my practice. And all I ask is that you do your best to collect my receivables and pay my receivables for what I've already earned. But the big thing, I want you to take my law partner as your partner. So that's how my 35 year partner, Dixon Lee, became my partner. So by about 1980, 82, I had the largest divorce practice in South Carolina. What a great story. I mean, it was, it was just amazing. And um, Jan lived a number of years and his daughter is going to, about to become one of our partners, uh, Carrie Warner. And she's been to Nita and went through the training out there in Boulder with us. Um, but he, Dixon was a great guy and Dick, Jan was a great guy. Um, he and I, he came back later and kind of remade himself into uh, a less stressful, uh, put himself in a less stressful situation, became an elder lawyer. And he went and got his LLM, uh, his LLM from Emory became an elder lawyer, still did a few divorce cases, but he would associate me in those cases. So he and I would go try them, and we were coming back from a place called Cl in Clarendon County, which is 
a place if you want to get um, hometown, um, you better be prepared for it. Um, and we did okay. And we always would stop on the way back and um, get a vanilla milkshake. Always. And we would stop at uh, one of those drive-in places and get a vanilla milkshake. And on this, the last time we did it, he, I said, you want a vanilla milkshake? He says, yeah. And he said, get me some fries. And I said, I looked at him and I said, you've decided to die, haven't you? And he says, yeah, I'm going into hospice on Monday. Mm -hmm. And he had battled colon cancer for a year or two up to that point. And he just couldn't do it anymore. And so we had our vanilla milkshake, fries, cried a little bit. He went into hospice on Monday. And by the following Monday, he was dead. Bet you miss him. What's that? I bet you miss him. I do. I miss him a lot. Mm -hmm. I miss him a lot. Great trial lawyer, tough as nails. And he could always figure out the theory of the case, where we we're going, where we we're driving the bus. And he was single minded, and never lost sight of that. Uh, you wanted somebody in the trench next to you, you wanted him there. And you just fight it out. And we had a lot of hard cases, politically sensitive cases, cases that you know a lot of lawyers wouldn't do because of the, the heat that was involved with them. And uh, he and I did a lot of those. And we enjoyed it, didn't mind the heat. And we had a vanilla milkshake every time we came back from court. But he was a good guy. You talk about his stress and, and how it kind of made him redirect his practice. How do you manage stress? How do you do it? A um, couple things. I, I try to manage my emotions, meaning I rarely get angry. Rarely. I, I, I don't like that emotion. Anger lowers your IQ. And it shows things that you don't need to show and you don't think like you should. So um, you have lots of opportunities in family law to become angry. And we have all kinds of lawyers in the practice. I mean, I love lawyers. Lawyers are my best friends. Um, but we also have some that are not so nice people that you can't trust and that sort of thing. And that's probably the most distressing part of the practice. But the every day of it, we got people at the worst time of their life, asking me to take them and their family in my hands and make it turn out as well as I can turn it out. And that's what I have to do. Um, so I focus on that, not on, not the stress of it. Um, anybody in my staff will tell you that I work hard, I prepare, but I don't get upset. I just, that's just my nature. I just don't get upset by it. And I, I think I live on it. I think I thrive on the stress of it. It's, um, I don't know what it is, but it's, it's, um, in this business, if you, if you don't have the fire and the passion for family law and people and being a good advocate, you shouldn't do it. It's too hard. Um, and a lot of people try it and they just can't do it. And some people stay in it and they should have never stayed in it. Um, so I, I think it takes um, all the good lawyers that I've learned from, and there have been many that I've learned from, have always been low key in terms of their emotions. They don't show it to you. Um, you know, they just, they're just smart people. One lawyer I just love, he's, he's about, he's in his 80s now. His name is Kermit King. And Kermit looks like your consummate uh, English barrister with a straight out um, always wore a vest. Um, I don't think he ever saw the beach except for looking through glass. I can't imagine he ever walked on the beach. And oh, it had perfect speech, per perfect diction and grammar. And was just the smartest guy in the world. 
And I learned from him that if you, if you use being smart and can demonstrate that you're smarter than the other guy about whatever your theory is, however you put it, you have a much greater likelihood of winning. And he was always smart. And he would get up and he'd have these terrible facts and make this wonderful, elegant argument. And I'm sitting there, I would be totally convinced. And I usually began my reply by saying, I really enjoy Mr. King's presentation. They're almost convincing until I really look under the covers. You know, he's, he, was just, he was just so good. And I, he's uh, since retired and I have lunch with him every once in a while and we talk. And, um, he tells great stories. He's just a great guy. Um, you know, some other people that taught me, and uh, you may you may have remembered Kerm I mean Harvey Golden. Yes. Harvey Golden was the kind of the godfather of family law in South Carolina. And he was the first one of us to get involved outside the state on a national leadership basis. And he went on to chair the family law section of the bar, the, um, uh, the, the bar if I remember correctly. And uh, he was also in the academy. He was just a great guy. And he taught, and he taught unselfishly. And he would tell us the secrets of the trade. I remember him giving us a lecture on calling the enemy party as an adverse witness, as the first witness in your case. And he's talked about how and when to do that. And the following week, I had a case with him. And he'd gotten an emergency hearing in front of a judge he was very friendly with. And he was friendly with all of them, but he was particularly friendly with this judge. And he knew my client was out of state. And he knew that my expert was like wandering around in the Sedona desert someplace. So I had nobody. I had no client, no expert. No, nothing. And here's Harvey Golden, the dean of the family court bar. And he's, you know, he's killing me. So I called his client as my first witness. And I knew that this judge did not like any kind of immorality. And I said to her when I put her up on the stand, I said, do you have a couch in your living room? Yes. And is there a painting above the couch? Yes. And I said, does it have a word on it? And she said, yes. And I said, well, what is the word? And you can just spell it out if you want. And it began, it was the F word. And I could just see the judge just started to shake his head like this. And I knew I had it. And then I went into your seven-year-old son sees this every day, all that sort of thing. And I won. I won because of what Harvey had shown us, me and others, the week before. And he shared that. And um, he, was, he was something else. And flash forward a few years, I represented the wife of a physician. He represented the husband. We were in front of a judge he was very friendly with. He had represented the judge in three driving under the influence charges. Okay, and in those days, you could do that and you didn't have to disclose it, but I knew it. And we were trying the case, well, we were trying the case in what was called the old Columbia Hospital, the hospital, but they had courtrooms in it now. And it had that awful green color and we're in a courtroom. My client had to try the case, she needed money, but she had a terrible back problem and couldn't sit in a chair. So I had a hospital bed brought into the, into the courtroom, appropriate for the place. And so she sat in the hospital, lay down in the hospital bed for the whole trial. So I put her up as a witness, she testifies. And Harvey gets to cross examine her and he was tough. The first thing he did was make her cry. Second thing he did, he made her pee her pants in the hospital bed. Now this is a woman who allegedly could not move around or wasn't agile or anything like that. And towards the middle of it, 
she jumps up in the bed like a flying Walenda <laughs> and calls uh, Mr. Golden an anti-Semitic name as she bounces off the bed on the floor and runs out the door of the court. <laughs> and not to be found for like three days. So Harvey and I got pretty crosswise about all that because you know, I wasn't getting a fair shake and the judge was treating me bad and stuff. So anyway, we had to make up. So Harvey brought me to my office a pile of bull manure that had been lacquered with a pen. And it said, if you can't baffle them with your, or dazzle them with your brilliance, baffle them with your bullshit. And he gave that to me as a peace offering. So I had to then find something to give back. So I bought a life-size set of armor and had it painted gold. and had some sign about the golden warrior put on it. And I went to his office and presented that to him. Later in life, Harvey, Harvey got sick, and he was a good bit older than I was. He was in the hospital, and uh, I was there with his wife, Heidi, and helped her get him, get him home. And he died several days later at home. But he penned out, actually he dictated to Heidi, a codicil to his will, willing me back the suit of armor and saying all these nice things. So I have that suit of armor sitting in my office just outside the entry of the door with the codicil to the will there. It's a great memory for me. So um, it requires a lot of emotional maturity to be embroiled in tough cases against adversaries and yet re maintain friendship with them. It sounds like you've been successful with that. It's hard. I mean, you, I, I, I would say yes. Yes, I've been able to do that. But, you know, we all get crosswise with each other. I mean, it just happens. And you have to be very, you decide whether you're going to land that punch or not, how you're going to do it. Um, I take great pride with the people I'm friends with in the bar. I mean, we're most all of us, probably 90% of us are close personal friends. We do things socially and professionally. And um, it, it takes effort to do that. And one, one rule that I have, is I never attribute bad motive. So many things happen in a case, you don't know who's doing it. You know, don't know whether the spouse on the other side is driving the issue or whether it's the lawyer and whether the lawyer's making it unnecessarily difficult. And it's very easy to come to that conclusion. And I had, the way I made this rule for myself, I think, I had this lawyer on the other side who has a reputation of being difficult for no good reason. So I attributed bad motive to him every opportunity I had because I was positive that he was the problem, not his client. Well, he and his client parted ways and his client filed a grievance against that lawyer, against me, against the judge, against the court reporter, against the guardian ad litem, and anybody else that touched this case, all the experts, massive grievance. Well, it all got sorted out and eventually dismissed, but in the process, the lawyer had to cough up his communication with his client, the one guy who had filed the grievance. And the other lawyer, all through it was defending me. He was saying, quit being upset with McLaren. McLaren is simply representing his client and the positions he's taking are good faith positions. Quit, leave it alone. And he defended me for like two years. And here I am imputing bad motive to him. And I promised after, I, after that case, it was a good while ago, I would never do that again. I'd never do that again. One of your other rules, and this actually is something Kerry spoke to, don't become your client, maintain professional independence at all times. Kerry said this is one of the hardest things for us to do as divorce lawyers. You wanna to speak to that? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Um, there's nothing more important in terms of rules of the road in divorce practice than uh, maintaining your professional independence. Uh, you can't become your client. You just can never do that. And if you do that, you lose your effectiveness, you lose your credibility. 
And you have to work at that every day. Now, passion is different. Zeal is different. Professional independence is different from those. And you have to be passionate. You have to have zeal. But you need to be able to look back and look at things and with an independent eye. Yesterday I had a mediation and we were on this lockdown with this virus and we were doing it on Zoom. And so we had the first meeting was me, my client and a mediator kind of explaining the rules of the road. And I said to her, I said, you know, we need to listen. We need to do more listening than talking. And you need to be thinking about what's good for you. What makes sense for you? But you then need to say, what makes sense for him? Because if it doesn't make sense for him and it doesn't make sense for you at the same time, we don't settle the case. And you can only find a solution if you can step back and think about other considerations other than you. And most importantly, you need to think about your kids. So you have three compet competing interests there that you need to step back from. As lawyers, we always have to step back. We always have to care about our client, but we also have to consider in a detached way the interests of the other side and of the children. And in this business, you know, people like to say they won. I respectfully submit there's not much winning in this business. You may come out on top on more issues than, than you don't, but winning really is driving it to a solution that makes sense for the family. And it's a lot different than what other lawyers do. If you're a, a, a plaintiff's lawyer in a personal injury case, you have one goal, to get as much money as you can for your client. There's no other competing interest. And the defense lawyer, he has one goal. He has to, to pay out the least amount of money. That's so far from what we do every day, I, I can't tell you. I mean, we, we have to think about the family and what makes sense and um, that sort of thing. That's what good lawyers do, right? Oh, you know, it's- A lot of learning. Young, young, you have to be, and this kind of goes hand in hand with it, you have to be confident in your advice. And young lawyers have a hard time doing that because they're young lawyers. They don't have the experience in it. Um, I hear so many law young lawyers saying, well, if I don't do this, he'll sue me. Or something like that. Some worrisome thing about the client's going to come back after him at the end. I can tell you I have never said that in my life. I have never thought that in my life. I give my advice based upon what I think the advice should be, not of some potential shortcoming on my part or am I going to get sued or grieved after it's over. I want my advice to be right and I want to be confident in it. And more importantly, I want the client to listen to my advice. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't backslide out of that. Younger lawyers have more difficulty with that. And I've had some older lawyers, friends of mine, that I remember one would always say to me, we'd be done with the case. This is an experienced lawyer, a member of the academy, my friend. And he would always say, did I do the right thing? You know, and I wanted to slap him. <laughs> I wanted to slap him. I mean, you know, it's not my place to tell him whether he did the right thing representing his client. And I, I was upset in a way that he needed that assurance or adulation after the fact to feel good about what he did if that makes sense mm -hmm. this you know this is being a divorce lawyer is like walking on one of these ridges and you've only got this single little path and it's so easy to fall off and that path is tough to maintain but you got to maintain it and walk walk the line all the way and you can't do that unless you're confident in your advice. And you can't do that unless you prepare the case and really feel confident in what you're doing. And no case is perfect. That perfect cases don't exist. They don't exist.
they settle. <laughs> they do. They do. Um, I would say, you know, we didn't start mediation until the early 1990s. And uh, at that time, the common thought, including me, was mediation is for sissies. Nobody does mediation. But our Supreme Court at that time, the Chief Justice at that time, was really behind mediation. And so I went and got trained, I think by the academy as, an, as a mediator and an arbitrator and then by the bar. And I, but I only did that because I wanted to know what the enemy was doing. I did not do it for any good purpose, I must confess. But over the years, I've learned it's one of the most useful things that we do in the practice of law. Mediate, mediated cases, 95% of them settle. I would say a higher percentage of my cases settle than go to trial. And, you know, from our standpoint, you have to have two basic skills, and if you don't have it, you shouldn't do it. You need to know how to negotiate, and you need to know how to try a case. You cannot negotiate a case if you're a paper tiger. You can't try the case. You need to be able to try the case. So there's a consequence to the other side not agreeing with you. And negotiation is a skill. And there's lots of places you can go. The academy puts on a, um, a mediation training at the Harvard Law School. And I attended that, it was great. Um, you learn a lot of things. The negotiation is very important. And it's, um, we have one lawyer around here who's my friend, and I hate negotiating with him because he'll get to a certain point and he'll always say, He ain't going to do that. He ain't going to do that. And I have to say, John, you always say that. But there's always a way we can find to get this issue resolved. And there always is. I mean, it's not just a box with four corners. You have your job as a lawyer is to create more alternatives within the box, create more corners, so you can find a place everybody can live. With. Do you mediate today? You yourself are you a mediator? I did a mediator yesterday. I was a lawyer for one of the parties yesterday. I I don't. I rarely am the mediator. I've been asked by some of my lawyer friends to mediate cases they thought were difficult or they thought I might fit with, well with. And um, that's a tough role. I mean, being the mediator is no easy task. Yeah. But you're on, you're on, on, you're turned on in the whole process. The lawyers, we have a lot of downtime. Sit, scribble, talk with our clients, look at alternatives write parts of an agreement. It's a very relaxed process, but for the mediator, you're on. Um, and I've done, I've done some work as being the mediator, and I like it, but I, I like being a lawyer better. I like being a lawyer for a litigant better. We don't do any collaborative law. Um, maybe I'm just old school about that, but I believe what the ABA originally believed, that there's some issue, ethical issues with it because your allegiance is to the agreement, not necessarily to the client. Meaning that you don't follow the rules, you don't stay in the process, then you have to fire everybody and start over again. And um, I just think we're better than that. I think we uh, can have settlement conferences, settle cases, have mediations, settle the cases in what I'd call the traditional format. What's the best part of being a lawyer? Uh, you know, you have all different seasons as a lawyer. And I've been a lawyer for 44 years now. And, you know, in, in some professions, you get too old to do it. In our profession, there really is no such thing as too old. Um, I, I learn every day. You learn every day. We never stop learning. And so, and our skills get better and better and our relationships get better and better. You know, I, I know everybody who practices in this area. There are certainly new, younger lawyers and I try to meet them and I always try to be kind and helpful to younger lawyers. And you know, 
they like to make their bones. So if they can beat somebody they perceive has been doing it a long time, they like to do that. And that's okay. I understand that. I understand that. But it's it's so energy it's so energizing. I mean, I, I get up every day and I'm a happy guy to go and what's next? You know, and I when I'm at the office, you know, my client my staff lays out all the files and all the things that I have to deal with that day on the table. And I just start working my way through it, seeing clients and um, helping people work through the worst time of their life. And then trying cases is great. Um, the longest trial I ever tried was three months. And it was out of town. Luckily, it was in Charleston, South Carolina, which is a wonderful town to have to have a trial. Um, and I stayed in the Mills house, and it was a very high dollar case. It also had some personal stuff involved in it that was um, difficult, I would say. But three months, a three month trial is tough. And um, and in that one, we had a private judge because we didn't want any of the public. Nonetheless, it was a trial. Um, I tried lots of week to 10 day cases and those are exciting. You know, the the adrenaline really pushes when you have a trial. I mean, you're, you're the guy, you're the guy. And uh, there may be a lot of other people involved in it but you're driving the race car. And it's like driving a race car. The same high you get from it, from the speed, uh, the uncertainty, um, planning. I had a client recently and he was, he had been accused of some bad stuff with his kids. And I didn't think it was true. And I looked into it very carefully and I, I said, this is what we need to do, A, B, C, and D. And it was pretty risky because there are lots of pieces that might not have worked, but it did work. And it took me six months to get him back in the life, lives of his kids. And I got it completely turned around on a theory that I developed on the first day I met him. That's exciting. I mean, for me, that's exciting. Um, and all the friends I have in the law, I mean, I have friends all around the country. And um, Carrie Mogerman, who you interviewed, a great guy. I've come to really like Carrie and his wife, D. He's a great lawyer. He's a great human being. Um, he's everything a lawyer should be, in my view. He's a really good guy. Um, it's just fun. It's just fun. There's nothing... You know, I did, when I decided to, to go to law school, I had finished, I grew up in New Jersey, but I went to the University of South Carolina when I was 18 for my undergraduate degree. And I ended up with a social and a degree in social and behavioral sciences and a minor in business. And that turned out to be the ultimate accidental tourist because the admission committee of the law school was composed of two lawyers, two professors from Yale that had graduated in their social and behavioral science area of the law. I think that's how I got in, I think. And um, so I became a lawyer, I went to law school, and then I had to decide, you know, what, what path I was going, I explained how all that went. Um, but that was, you know, we're accidental tourists. And, my, you know, you have to leave room for your personal life. And that's always hard. My wife and I have been married, this year will be 48 years. And if I remember from law school's days, there was a, a, a term called tacking. That's all one straight run. That wasn't tacking different marriages together to her or they, but anybody else. And we've had a wonderful 48 years. We have two great kids um, and a grandson. My wife, um, now that we're in this lockdown, she's homeschooling. I mean, she was a teacher. She had a teaching career, teaching kids, um, really bright kids who were underachieving. She's really good at that. 
So it, I found it at first hard to separate and hard to make what I would call me family time. At the end of my first 10 years of practice, I looked back and I was really kind of mad at myself because I had worked 365 days a year for 10 years. I would never took a day off where I didn't work for 10 years. And I said, I've made a mistake. I'm not going to do that again. And so I began the process of trying to make space in my life for things more family related, more me related. You know, I have, I don't have a lot of hobbies. I like to play golf. I used to be a good golfer. I'm not a good golfer anymore, but I like to go out there and knock it around. I like to garden. I have a garden and every day I go out there and putter a little bit and pick some weeds and harvest some lettuce and tomatoes. And I like to collect art. You see some art behind me. I like to collect etchings from the late 1800s and early 1900s, um, which I re that really came about because of a friendship with a lawyer. We were in Chicago for an American Academy meeting. We went over to Michigan Avenue and started looking at old Whistler etchings and a guy named Mortimer Memphis. And the director of the place we're in said, well, we have a lot more upstairs. And he took us upstairs and we went through hundreds of etchings that they had that were unframed but and uncatalogued. And he took us through them all and explained them, explained what the good, the bad, the ugly, all the details of it. And um, so that kind of got me into art collecting. Uh, but it was, it was good. So I've got some sense of about, I have more balance now than I did a long time ago. So here's my final question for you. If you were not a lawyer, what would you have liked to have done? Ooh, that's a tough question. Um, hmm. You know, I... I race car driver. <laughs> what, yeah, maybe a race car driver. Um, you know, it's funny, when I was growing up, my dad uh, raced go-karts and um, you know, we came from a middle-class family and he had, he had go-karts and he would race and he was a New Jersey champion in racing go-karts. And so that was always kind of a passion and he was a heavy equipment um, mechanic and that was just like one of his jobs. He always worked very hard. So I have a, uh, I have a sort of a bent or talent for fixing things and working on things. I guess I would want to do something where I work more with my hands and fix things. And I like fixing things and little projects. And I can't, I can't, I got to tell you, I love lawyering so much. I have a hard time leaving, leaving any room in my mind that I would have done anything else. I mean, it's just, um, I have a passion for cooking. When I was in high school, I worked in some restaurants and came to know the owners well. And when I finished college, they offered to stake me money-wise in opening a restaurant, like $250,000 offer. And Pat and I talked about it long and hard, and that was pretty attractive. We would have started a career. And finally, I decided, you know, I don't want to be in the restaurant business for the rest of my life. I want to be a lawyer. And so I, I became a lawyer. Um, there's a lot of pieces to being a lawyer. My piece is family law, representing families and people in those families and going to court. But there's a lot of other you know, nooks and crannies in the law that if I had to pick something else, I probably would have picked something else. But I like trying cases. I like that a lot. Um, I miss not trying cases in front of juries. I mean, that was, that was really something. That was, um, that's a different skill. It's not a lot different, but it's um, just different. And maybe it would have been something else within the law, but I can't imagine doing anything outside the law. I know that's probably a terrible answer and not very creative, but that's how it strikes. It's honest, right? It's honest. No regrets. Yeah. No regrets. Now I have 
I have zero regret, regrets in what I've done. I mean, I, I became president of the American Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers, and I guess it was 95. I spent my career really building towards that. I, I don't like lawyer advertising. I don't think that's a way to get business. I don't think that's a way to build a reputation. And I, I spent my career, um, if you look at the bio I gave you and kind of look, I, I did steady all the way through CLEs from early in my career. So I volunteered to do this and that, and I didn't really care what it was. Uh, but I spoke a lot on family law. And that put me in front of a lot of people and I tried a lot of cases and I kept my reputation and built it and built it and built it. And I was president of the um, South Carolina Bar Family Law Section, uh, did a lot of local stuff. And then eventually on a national scale and became president of the Academy, which was for me kind of was like a crowning achievement of my professional career. That was a lot of fun, met a lot of wonderful people. Uh, got to do go a lot of different places. Got to host a meeting in Panama. Got to take all my buddies through the Panama Canal. And it was just terrific. Got to meet and talk with the president of Panama. I mean, it was just a remarkable experience. And, uh, the law's been so, good to you. What's that? The law's been good to you. It, it, law has been very good to me. Very good to me. And I. Uh, I'm very appreciative of that, and uh, and I got to meet people like you and Carrie and other folks that have just been remarkable people in my life. That have, I've learned something from everybody, and I really believe that as we walk through our time here, you have to learn from everybody and everything that you do. If you do that, it's a remarkable experience. Uh, where can people get a hold of you? Um, well, I'm in Columbia, South Carolina, and um, they can Google me, James McLaren, and that's uh, my email is J, the letter J, McLaren at, at McLarenandLee.com. It's M C L A R E N and Andy Lee.com. Or just call me in my office, which is 803 799 3074. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Well, I'm so honored that you shared your time and your life, your professional life with us today. Well, thank you. I enjoyed it very much. And, you know, I was thinking through what I would talk about and tried to gather some things that I, I sent to you. And there are lots of stories embedded and all that that we didn't talk about, but uh, I thought we talk about, talked about enough. Yeah, I'm going to post uh, the materials you sent me on my resource page of my blog for others. So again, thank you for your time. And this will be uh, on YouTube. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna do a, an article about encapsulating some of your wisdom that you gave us today. Very good, thank you, Steve. I appreciate you asking me to do this. You bet, talk to you later. Bye-bye.